Welcome back. Drive the Lane podcast. We have an exciting episode for you today as things are starting to heat up with the TBT basketball tournament. We have co-founder Dan Friel on the show to talk about all things TBT. We have our good friend Andrew Dockage on the show who's going to add some fuel to the Carmen's Crew versus Big X rivalry fire. We talk a little bit about some of the things we took for granted before, uh, before quarantine hit. And of course, we're going to have some fun. And of course, we're presented by High Street Tees. Head on over to highstreettees.com slash DTL. Use our promo code DTL15, and you're going to get 15% off your entire order, which includes our shirts, which you should buy if you have not yet. But we'll buckle up and drive the lane and get right to it. Joey, how are we feeling today, man? I'm, I'm feeling okay. Um, sports are back, which I think we can both agree on. We're recording this Sunday. Um, I watched UFC socially distant with like two buddies last night. So that was really the first time I ever sat down and watched UFC. I like throughout the whole entire thing. So that was cool. That was sports. It was so bizarre because it's an empty arena and they walk in and they're like, yeah, Mm. it's to no one. So that's, that was, but that was great. And then today we got some golf. We got Dustin Johnson and Ricky Fowler versus Matthew Wolf and or Dustin Johnson and, and Rory McIlroy versus Ricky Fowler and Matthew Wolf in some in a skins charity uh, little little thing going on. So I'm excited to watch that. Um, so golf, I mean, oh, so uh, gambling is back too, is what you're trying to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And with sports being back, gambling is also back as well. Um, yeah, I, I think the combination of like. You know, the last dance kind of was like, oh, look, here's some highlights that some people have never seen before. Like, that's kind of like sports. And now we're slowly, like, baseball's talking about being back and NBA is, is opening up their facilities and stuff. Like, And sports, TBT. The TBT, exactly. Sports, I mean, it's just – congratulations, guys. We made it through. <laughs> and congratulations to uh, the class of 2020 high school and college. You guys did it. Our friend LeBron put on a fantastic – a fantastically produced show, but congratulations from your favorite podcasters. You were frozen there for a second. You all good? You were frozen there for a second. <laughs> well, hopefully I got recorded, but anyway, let's get to, <laughs> let's get to the stuff we took for granted during quarantine. Joey, this was your idea. I think you should probably start us off. Number one on my list of things that I took for granted, hugs, hugs. I think, You know, I am quarantined with my family, my sister, my parents, my dad, so I can hug them still, but it doesn't feel the same because, because they're not, it's not the same kind of hugs. You know, I go, you're walking down the street and you see your, your friend, he's also walking on the other side of the street. You can't go over there, dap him up, give him a little bro hug anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's not happening, but, but how great does a hug feel off the charts? So hugs, number one thing I took for granted. All right, number one thing I took for granted, which is way different than yours, spring football games, the spring game, okay? (laughs) Because usually they're dumb and it's just a waste of time, but boy, oh boy, would I have loved to have seen Justin Fields in that spring game this year. And I miss it. And I think I'm going to tweet this to Ryan Day and say, we are with you. We miss the spring games. We took spring games for granted. Mizzou always has a fun spring game as well. Friends, my friends and I were talking about maybe going down for it this year, having a nice weekend. So spring game took for granted. Uh, clearly, we are on the on different wavelengths in terms of what we miss and stuff. Obviously, we are. No, I got some other ones that are on your same wavelength. Okay. But all right, good. Because I want Ryan Day to know. Ryan Day about missing spring games and stuff. I'm just talking. I mean. The next one on my list is is touching door handles, because <laughs> because now every time I go like, you know, maybe once a week I'll like order out from somewhere and pick it up for lunch. And when I go there, like I'm wearing gloves and stuff. And even when I'm wearing gloves and a mask, like I'm still like super cautious about what I'm touching and stuff. Even you know what I mean? Like it's just the idea of just like doorknobs, door handles, push to open doors, stuff like that. It's just like everyone's gonna be so conscious of what they're touching now Mm -hmm. just so and then like you can't touch your face like I can't pick my nose anymore like what is that like come on that's I I miss finishing my glass of water before the waiter can get to me to fill it up 
that is such a thrill when you finish your glass before the waiter makes it over. It's always a competition. Can you, can you down this glass of water before the waiter comes back and says, water? So I miss that because now I have to get up and go to the fridge or go to the that's, sink. That's a great call. I, when I was thinking about some of the things I took for granted, like I, di I didn't want to say this, but like being waited on, you know, like, <laughs> like that's so terrible to say, but sometimes like going to, it's fun to go to a restaurant and you're just like, you know, you know, you like all you're concerned about is eating and paying. You know what I mean? Like you don't got to chef it up or anything like that. You just, but I didn't choose that one because <laughs> it doesn't sound great. But, but my last one, and this is the only sports one that I could really, that I really thought of that would be funny. Um, the basketball season kind of got taken from us right out from under our feet. So this is kind of a two in one type of deal. West coast NBA games that no one cares about at midnight and and Pac-12 after dark basketball games that no one cares about. Like, I yeah, but pay but those were over. Dollars to watch Arizona State versus Washington State on the Pac-12 network at twelve at, with a eleven thirty Central Time tip right now. But that was like that was over. We're not really missing. We didn't really miss out on that. Hey man, we didn't get the Pac-12 tournament at all. So just saying. Fair enough. I mean, those late games in the NCAA tournament are awesome. Obviously, like we like those. But, yeah, you know, like. You know, a little Oregon versus Washington, you know, like, that'd be nice with a little 10-30 tip. I miss uh, one-liners with, like, Starbucks baristas, like making little jokes to strangers. Now no one wants to be anywhere near you or talk to you, you know? Like, you're waiting in line uh, at, like, the grocery store to pay, and you, like, look at the person behind you, and you're like, this is going quick. You know, no one wants to hear your stupid – they just want to get through the line and get out. Yeah, there's no, uh, there's no, conver yeah, I mean, like, I guess to, like, bubble that into one idea, it's, like, conversing with strangers, like, that just doesn't happen anymore. There's no small talk, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, you go, you go to, like, the grocery store, for example, everyone, it's, like, <laughs> at the grocery store, it's, like, every man for themselves. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? It's there's no, there's no new friendships brewing. That's for sure. Yeah. And Nancy Lane is upset about that. She loves the small talk. But something new that is brewing is there's a bunch of new uh, new faces in the TBT tournament. Should we jump into that? That was a good transition. Yeah, it's pretty yes, – you're a pro. Pro's pro. Um, the TBT is so incredibly exciting this year because, number one, it's probably going to be the – first like real sporting event like type of even though we talked to Dan Friel and he does it's not a league it's an event so um it, it's gonna be fun like yeah there might be some golf stuff going on in UFC blah 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 but like basketball football ba like you know like the major sports like that's what we're looking for and the first basketball competition is gonna be the TBT and it's it sure sounds like it's gonna happen um and it's gonna happen with Every single Ohio State basketball player that's ever played at Ohio State is going to be in the tournament. Whether yep. they're on Carmen's crew, the Big X team um, that's coached – that's well, not coached but created by Andrew Dockage, or this new team, the Great Lakes Elite, which is coached by my former teammate Jake Lorbach, who was on the show one time for the walk-on interview but then told us to cut everything out because he wasn't excited about it. So yeah, he, he, never blew, got his, he blew his Lorbach. chance. <laughs> <laughs> the year is still young, obviously, though, Jake. But he's got an exciting team with guys like Cam Williams and Mark Loving on it. So, so more teammates of mine on a team. But it's just – it's crazy. But specifically, like, Carmen's crew is obviously trying to defend their title. Um, and they they have the, the basically the same team. Dallas Lauderdale is not an assistant coach anymore. Now he's playing. But besides that, the exact same team, basically. And then um, the big X is just the same guys that they had plus more former Ohio State basketball players, I'm sure. So, like, Andre Wesson, for example, they announced him. There are some more announcements for that team. Um, hopefully they're more Ohio State guys. There will definitely be other Big Ten guys. It, it, they, they're going to have a really solid squad. And I don't know if Dockich, he's going to come on in a second to, to kind of mm -hmm. juice up this rivalry that they got going with Carmen's crew. Maybe he'll give us some, some, some hints about who, who to expect on their team. But um, it'll be – I'm just – I mean – I don't know who to root for. I think I'm, I'm slowly – you're watching me slowly change sides to Big X in terms of my fandom because their whole team is made up of my teammates, whereas 
not, it used to just be that was the Ohio State team. Now it's like, shit, this is kind of an Ohio yeah. State team too. For those of you who don't remember, the TBT tournament really kick-started driving the lane because the tournament was in Chicago. We were able to interview Sollinger, Kraft, Diebler. So that was really the beginning of it all. So I, I want to see if we can name all the Ohio State players that are confirmed in it as of now. And this is probably kind of silly because there will probably be 19 more before this episode yeah. comes out. So we got – We got – well, Carmen's crew is easy. We got Sully, Diebler, Kraft, Buford, Lighty, Lauderdale. Evan I think Turner's that's it. Whatever. Evan Turner's coaching, Sully's coaching. But I think that's it. And then okay. Big X. We got Dockage. Um – we got Dockage, Andre Wesson, CJ, and Keyshawn so far. I'm sure they'll – who knows who they'll pull out that is a familiar face that we know, whether it's Ohio State or beyond. But in terms of Ohio State guys, that's it. And then and Cam then Williams. Late, we got Cam, Cam Williams and Mark Loving. So, coached by Lorbach. Coached by Lorbach. So, I mean, which team is going to land me? That's just the last question, obviously. Uh, when I was in high school, we, we entered an AAU tournament and we wanted to do the name Luol Dang Elite and just, like, pick a random Bulls player and, and put, like, Elite. Like, I feel like that's what Lorebox team is doing with Great Lakes Elite. Like, it's, like, Elite makes you sound like such a better, like, oh, my God, this is – of all the Great Lakes team, this is the Elite one. What would our team if, – if we w- – we're not Drive the Lane team. What would our team name be? Well, we'd be Metro Media Jam Champs <laughs> team. <laughs> the Metro Media Jams. No, yeah, we'd probably be the North Shore Knights. That'd be cool. That was, I think that was a team growing up in AAU. Maybe really? Yeah, whatever. But, yeah. So, so there's, a lot, there's a lot of other alumni teams that, if, you, if from the Carmen's crew perspective, I would be a little nervous about. You know, Syracuse, the Bayheim's Army always loads up with former Syracuse players. Um, the Purdue team, which are they playing for the first time this year? Yeah. They're going to be really, really, really good. The uh, Illinois team is going to be really, really good. A, a lot of these teams are going to be similar to Carmen's crew in terms of guys that made deep NCAA tournament runs or deep Big Ten tournament runs and now are <laughs> coming together for – I guess it's not fair to compare them to Carmen's crew who went to Elite Eights and Final Fours and, and – national championships but you know what you you know what i'm saying yeah no there are plenty of incredible teams and that's just talking about you know alumni teams because if you talk about um you know teams that are just made up of of professional basketball players i mean those teams could even be scarier i mean we didn't even talk about marquette's team that that lost in the championship last year press Um, virginia yeah they're not we talk about the west virginia team a little bit with uh with, with with Dan. So yeah, some of the teams that follow us on Twitter, which I hope these teams know that if we're gonna if we're gonna cheer for one team, it's gonna be Big X or Carmen's crew. But if you want to keep following us on Twitter, maybe we'll be your team or yeah, we'll cheer I mean, for your team. We could be bought. That's for we sure. We can definitely be bought. So we got Utah Valor TBT, which is Utah alumni. I guess. <laughs> and then we got Everline Drive, which they're a recurring team. They're always in it. They're always – last year they were in the lead eight, 2018 runner-up. They're always good. Dream Big Sports TBT. Haven't heard of these guys yet. Assume they're going to be good. That should be our name. Dream, Dream Big, Big Sports. Sports. Big X follows us. Carmen's crew obviously follows us. Are we like the, the fans that you want cheering for you? Because I'm pretty sure last year the team we were cheering for took home the crowd. Hey, man, I'm just saying, if you heard of a little thing called the drive line bump, it's just, it's real. So, I mean, well, we'd like to announce our fandom right now is for, is for Dream Big Sports. That's our, that's our. Officially, team. Dream Big Sports, we will be. But also, a little rumor that TBT posted about, the GOAT is starting a team. We won't spoil what we talked about in, uh, in the interview. That I could can cool. tell you that it's not me starting a team. We Correct. That could quickly become our, our favorite team <laughs> based on the fact that we would like to interview some members and general managers of that team. Yeah, well, not me, but maybe Andrew. You wouldn't yeah. want to interview the general manager of that team? No, I would, but it wouldn't be my favorite <laughs> team. Yeah, probably not mine either. Definitely not. <laughs> When's Dockage coming on? Did he give yeah, you a time? I don't know. He is. We're, we're waiting. We're on. 
we're on to Andrew Dockett's watch right now. He texted me. He's on the 17th green. He would love to come on and put some jabs in the hearts of, of Carmen's crew and their fans. So now we just are waiting for him. Um, but in the meantime, you know, we could talk about something else. We could also just take a little pause and, and come back on when he's back. All right. Well, we'll catch you guys when Andrew Dockett is back on. All right. All right. We now welcome back onto the show our best friend, <laughs> Andrew Dockage. Dockage, welcome back. What are you up to right now? <laughs> well, first of all, it's great to be back. Um, I'm actually just driving back to my house right now after getting my ass whacked by my uncle and my father on the golf course. So uh, not a great Sunday, but when you get to play golf, it's, you know, it's all right. Yeah, okay. we uh, it's pouring in in Chicago in the Chicagoland area, and there's no golf being played today. So, you know, oh. at least you could take some take the positives away that you were on the course today. You're right, but just 170 dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Michael Jordan, except his probably was worth 170 thousand dollars of his gambling addiction. Yeah, but yeah. that 170 dollars will be nothing when you take home your percentage of two million from this summer's TBT basketball tournament with Big X. First of all, congratulations on your eventual return to the court. That's a big deal. <laughs> Congratulate me after the tournament when my knee is still intact. Let's just say that because who knows what it's going to look like. But I'm excited. I'm really, I'm I'm really looking forward to playing again with some of you know former teammates from. Um, Joey and I's basketball team at Ohio State, so it'll it'll be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, sure. talk uh, talk some more about the fact that you guys are are becoming the new age Ohio State alumni team. Carmen Crew Jr. That's what our <laughs> team should be. Um, no, it's it's fun. You know, all these guys are obviously playing overseas, um, and you know they 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 want a piece of of the old heads, and you know they they waxed us last year, and they obviously won it. Uh, but it's just fun getting to match up. Like, you know, you idolize these guys growing up. Like, I idolize Aaron Kraft, for instance, and just get a match up against him. I'm not saying it's going to go my way, but just kind of having that. Um, he's talking in slow motion, <laughs> like his, like his that speed. That like he's match up, hopefully. Uh, what would you say? You're kind of going in and out. We're going we, in and I out think we got you back now. It was looking like you were oh, talking in slow motion, so I was like, "Oh, it's just like his playing style." Oh, my fault. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, um, what did it, what did you catch me here? What did you hear me say? That you're excited right? to match up with Aaron Kraft because you idolize him and you'll never be him, something like that. Yeah, that's that. Let's just leave it. <laughs> let's just like leave it at that, and let's move on. You're right. So, pitch to us right now why we should be Big X fans this summer and not Carmen's crew. Um, because they're the old heads that have run its course, man. How many more years do they really got? And, you know, that we're, we're the up and coming, <laughs> I should say, um, with some of our guys. I think Keyshawn, Keyshawn Woods had an excellent year overseas, as well did uh, C.J. Jackson. I think Andre Wesson brings a lot. He's a solid player who played extra extraordinarily well for the Buckeyes these past few years. So, you know, I think we have some really good pieces, and we're about to add a couple more. Can't give you the insight on who yet, but um, that, that are not Buckeyes, though, um, that I think will suit well for our team, for sure. Do you have a message? Uh, do you have a message to Carmen's crew? No, I don't. Because like <laughs> I said, and whatever I say, they will laugh in my face and just tell me to look at their bank accounts because it says $150,000 richer than me since they won the championship last year. So, no, I don't. You know what I I'm think you guys need? You guys need L. D. Williams. L. D. would be solid. I, he might be on a team. That's a good. Um, Just because. He, why? L. Okay. Yeah. Why? Yeah, because <laughs> L. D. is best friends with all those guys, and he, you know, is from Columbus. Whatever. Obviously, he's not a Big Ten guy, so it doesn't quite work out to the name right. or whatever. But he could be the perfect like spy for you guys on them, and then you just announce him like at the last second. You know, hey, not a bad just, idea. I'm well, just thinking out loud. Let's, let's, Big X can have 
players from other conferences. I'm just going to put that out there. So maybe we did the last couple of years. I mean, we can't, it's, it's tough to, you know, a lot of guys are, well, first off, the big 10 is obviously really good, but a lot of guys either have something going on or really don't want to play. So it, it's a, uh, it's pick and choose with guys for sure. But um, I'm hoping it's mostly uh, Big Ten guys this year for sure. But it's still, what about, you know, it's still TBD. Uh, what about Mickey Mitchell? We got a chance of him Ooh. joining Big X? I don't know. Joey can, if Joey wants to get me on the line with him and thinks he's well worth it, great. <laughs> but I don't know Mickey Mitchell at all. You know, there, should, there should be a TBD team. Granted, it would only be five guys, but it's all those five guys that transferred from my freshman class. A talented crew, though, Smoke. Yeah, that would be a kid. <laughs> <laughs> a very talented crew, though. Who would win, that team or a team of all walk-ons? Oh, my gosh. Well, give me the five walk-ons, and then maybe we can make a case the for the five walk-ons. walk-ons. The five walk-ons are me, Rem Bacamus, J.R. Simon. That's a really short backcourt, but studs. And then uh, whoever you want in the front court, I don't know. Dude, you got to say, like, Grady Eifert, Andre Drummond, like, guys like okay. that. Dude. Andre Drummond doesn't count, but Grady Eifert counts. But I'm just thinking of – What about team. Adam Wolf? Yeah, and Adam Wolf. <laughs> you don't even know Adam Wolf. He released the Wolf. He's Adam a freaking Wolf. bucket, dude. You don't even know about Adam Wolf. Cool. <laughs> All right, Dockett, you got anything else for us? We don't really need you that much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I appreciate you having me on the show, though. It's Absolutely, we're looking. It will definitely be in it, and we and we are looking forward to uh, watching a first round matchup between Carmen's Crew and Big X this summer. I really hope it's not the first round matchup, <laughs> Doc. I just want before you go, I just want to let you know that the my needle in terms of who I'm rooting for is like almost all the way for Big X. So don't worry. Really, you weren't expecting that, were you? No. When are you gonna when are you gonna tweet that out? I don't know. I don't know. When, when you tweet out that we're getting a percentage of the uh, two million, then we'll tweet it out. <laughs> Done. You guys got it. Maybe my uh, my payment to you guys will allow you guys to come on the boat for a week and we'll play golf and have a great time in India. Oh, we just were finished talking about how we can be bought by any TBT team to be their fan. So <laughs> there you go. I don't, tough to beat. That's tough. Right to now, beat. the highest bidder is Dream Big Sports. Who, what is this? What, we what don't know, but we just – They follow us name. on Twitter. We yeah. think they follow us on Twitter. That name just resonates with us. Dream Big Sports, like that is who we are. I ca- it's a hit. It's a catch for sure. They follow you on Twitter? Yeah, yeah. Dream Big Sports. Oh, yeah, you're good. I don't know what it means, but hey. <laughs> Everything we like doing, dreaming, big sports. Big does get, sports. Does it get any better than that? <laughs> All right, Doc. Yeah, all right, Doc. Thank you, man. All right, y'all. Tell your dad we say hi. Probably not, but I will. All right. We'll see you in Indy. Later. All right. We now welcome on to the Drive the Lane podcast, Dan Friel, who is the co-founder of the TBT basketball tournament. Dan, welcome to the show. We are happy to have you. Thanks, Andrew. It's great to be here. Although here is just in my office where I'm always (laughs) now stuck. got a little background, though. That's a very cool kind of backdrop. Yeah, that that's a that's a remnant. I've got a TPT. Um, what do you call them? Uh, the stickums, the big giant stickers on my wall. That dates back from 2014. So I've had that for quite a while. That's uh, clearly the TBT theme of this podcast. I got the hat on. Dan's yep. got the background. Andrew was there. I got it in the heart. I got it in his heart. It's just. I have to send. I have to send your shirt. The uh, the semifinals and finals last year. So I got it in here and in here. That's great. That's great. We so, were just talking before we yeah, before no, we kind of got off. <laughs> but yeah, we were just talking about before before we went live how the TBT is, you know, that's the reason why Drive Lane Podcast is here right now is without a Carmen's crew winning, we wouldn't have had the jump start that we had. So we have first and foremost, we gotta thank you for that. Well, it's that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring opportunity to all the young men and young women across the land. And uh, if the Drive the Lane podcast podcast becomes the most popular podcast. In America, as I know that it will, uh, you guys will have us to thank at the end of the day. So I kind of said last year, you know, the confetti fell, Carmen's crew was crowned champs, and 
we dropped our episode with Jared Sollinger and Drive the Lane was born. But way before that, TBT was born. And I'm talking even before the first game. Can you take us to kind of the beginning of it all? Yeah. Um, John Mugar and I have been buddies since we were 12 years old. Um, huge sports fans. We've seen everything. Um, you know, from my perspective, I grew up in Boston. And I hate to sound like the classic shout ahead, but I had seen everything happen, you know, and John kind of felt the same way. And so we were looking for new ideas of like, and honestly, it literally started with a series of emails back and forth between John and I. This was probably in um, maybe late summer uh, 2009. So, you know, maybe like September, October, sometime around there. So anyways, we just started talking back and forth over email. This is before everybody even had iPhones. And we were just going back and forth about different ideas. Like if you were going to start um, some kind of sports property or a league or something from scratch, how would you do it? And uh, we just kind of settled on this winner takes all single elimination basketball tournament. The original idea was for $50 million, like five zero million. And um, obviously <laughs> we're not quite there yet, but when we do get to 50 million, uh, you know, it may take us 50 years to get there. But uh, when we do get there, you'll know that we will have achieved it. But the basic idea was like, you know, how do you do something new? How do you do something innovative? Um, but that is also very familiar. You know, everybody watches March Madness. And even if you don't watch March Madness, everybody understands the concept of a bracket and a single elimination event. And so it's very easy to follow and you can get wrapped up in it for a very relatively short period of time. You don't have to watch six months of a whole season. You basically just cut to game seven over and over and over again, 63 times. And so, um, you know, we launched a thing in 2014. We literally spent years kind of refining the idea. John, to his credit, went out and really worked hard to build a team that was going to build this thing into a real event. Um, neither one of us really came from uh, a professional sports industry background. So we had been in, in very different industries before this. And so we needed people that were going to be able to, to approach that. So John went out and he spoke to some really key figures in the sports industry, um, made a great hire in Jen Todd, who has been one of the most instrumental people in making this thing happen. And then um, in 2014, we launched it uh, sort of on a, um, on a wing and a prayer, so to speak. You know, like we didn't even know who was going to show up. It was 2014. And so we had one article written in Grantland that kind of announced this, this thing was going to happen. And we proposed the concept. We didn't have any teams lined up. We didn't know who would apply. It was open competition. Teams got voted in at that time by fans in an online you know, voting contest. And um, so anyways, we show up and it's, it's a Friday morning, uh, 32 teams. It was 8.30. The first game was at 8.30 in the morning. And there was this team, TIGTAL, T-Y-G-T-A-L. And I think it stands for like take your game to another level or something. Anyways, the roster had Marshall Henderson, who just finished his senior year at Ole Miss, and Hakeem Warwick from the block at Syracuse. And we were thinking, oh, there's no way that this, these guys are going to play. They're playing Olivet Nazarene, which is an NAIA school, I think, out of Indiana, if I'm not mistaken. And um, Marshall Henderson shows up five minutes before the game, shoes untied, <laughs> hair all over the place. And they end up winning the game with like five or six guys on the roster. It was unbelievable. It was like we were watching this. We couldn't believe that the game actually took place. And then from that point, it just momentum took off. And, um, you know, it really has been a great, a great run ever since. So something that I see has kind of really taken full form is what started as kind of people submitting teams has almost become what feels like an alumni-based tournament. When do you think that that corner was really turned where it went from people finding random guys and submitting teams to, okay, actually, why don't we make this kind of all alumni teams? Yeah. Well, you know, that's, that's an interesting thing. I mean, the first year that we played, there were, there's, there were several alumni teams. There was that Olivet Nazarene, Nazarene team that was a NAIA school. Um, the three programs that really stood out that year for me were Notre Dame, um, which actually won the whole thing. The fighting alumni won the tournament that year in 2014. And then you had a Princeton alumni team and a Cornell um, alumni team that brought back most of the guys from that Sweet 16 run that they had had, I think it was in 2010 or around there. Um, but what was, what's happened over the years is that as popularity has become more important in terms of the criteria to get in, teams that have a natural fan base or that have an ability to drive fans in support of them um, have really gained the upper hand. And alumni teams fit that bill to, to a T. They have a built-in fan base. They have fans that are familiar with these guys. They really fulfill this great fan niche. If you're a college sports fan, you've probably always wanted to see the guy that just missed playing with the other guy. 
you know, because they didn't overlap exactly. Or one guy came in the year after this guy left. And now you get to see those guys actually play in the same team and in the same colors and sort of in the same context. And it's really exciting for that. Um, you know, it's amazing because I do think that the attention really is placed upon the alumni teams from a fan perspective. And obviously we as a startup are trying to get as much, um, you know, uh, publicity and attention as we can. Um, we've never had more than 27 alumni teams compete in CBT out of the 64 teams that play in the field. And so it would actually, for me, I think it would be a lot of fun if we ended up getting to a consistent 32, because that way you could have one half of the bracket be alumni teams and one half of the bracket be guys like overseas elite or, um, you know, armored athlete or any of these other great sort of all-star type teams, uh, team Heinz, you know, which was an incredible team last year, uh, teams like that on the other side. I think that would be a lot of fun um, to see something like that happen. I, I think it's pretty cool to see, as you kind of mentioned that there is a perfect mix almost of these teams that are, guys you saw on TV playing together, old teammates back together, and then a, miss, a, a mix of, of some incredible guys that you might not have heard of and incredible guys you have heard of, like a Team Hines or Armored Athlete, as you mentioned. And it, yeah. it, it is really cool that when it comes to the Final Four, it seems like it's almost half and half every single time. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot coming, of fun. Coming from the, the alumni perspective, I think it is really, really cool for me, growing up a huge Ohio State fan, Huge Aaron Kraft fan, John Deebler, seeing all those guys get to come together. Um, speaking from the fans' perspective, that's what makes TBT so special. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, you know, we're, we're sports fans. That's why we started it to begin with. You know, we didn't really have any career aspirations um, in terms of, like, working in the sports industry or anything like this. We just literally came up with an idea that we thought would be fun. And if we were um, – we put ourselves in the sports fan shoe because that's who we are. And so that we thought it would be fun to see that exact scenario that you were talking about. You know, the one team that never came together that I thought would have been fun was that George Mason team that had the final four run, I think, in like 2009. Um, those guys were just a little bit too old as a group. But those are the types of things you get to see. And like you said, I mean, seeing Aaron Kraft and John Diebler and all those guys play last summer was just incredible. Is, is there – you kind of mentioned the George Mason team. Is there either a team or a, uh, maybe an individual that that's there, you're searching for, that's your North Star, he would be the perfect guy to be in TBT? Well, LeBron James would be ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, I know he didn't go to college, but can you, he's a huge Ohio State fan. How great would he look for Carmen's crew? Uh, <laughs> if we could ever work out the legalities of that, that would be amazing. You know, I think that for me, it's more, um, for me, it's like less personality driven than it is fan base driven. And so we've had some, some teams that have competed in the past that represent great fan bases that maybe didn't check all the boxes for them, you know? Um, schools like Gonzaga or Kentucky. And then we have other uh, programs from an alumni perspective that we've never had. You know, like we've never had a UNC team. We've never had a Duke team. Um, those teams, I think, would be fantastic if they could ever, you know, kind of come together and do it. But, you know, I think for me, I'm excited every year just because there's some guy that I either forgot about or I, I never knew about. Um, and now he's competing in TBT. And I'm just excited to kind of see the progression of those guys every year. So is it confirmed that uh, Bob Huggins is coaching the West Virginia alumni team this year. What's the, what are the rules with that? Well, all bets are off in Corona time, as you know. So uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. I, you know, I think he would do it. He seems like the kind of guy that would do it. And um, whether or not he's actually going to coach, I, I don't know. I, that was really hot and heavy, honestly, right before um, everything kind of got shut down. And he had said, yeah, I'll do it. And I think the plan was that he was going to donate uh, the money if he won to a, a charity. Um, you know, it'd be great if he did. I do think coaching generally is the next level um, of progression in TBT. And last summer, honestly, Jared Sullinger did an amazing job uh, coaching that Carmen's crew team. And so what you're seeing now is teams realize that they have to have um, a real sort of alpha male in charge. You, you can't just, it's not everything competition by committee. You've got to have someone that's calling the shots. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was fortunate enough to be in the locker room for the semifinal and the championship games. And I didn't know what, to, I mean, I had been, when it was in Columbus, I was hanging around those guys, and they were taking it seriously. Don't get me wrong. It's not in their DNA to not take it seriously. But there was definitely a notch up when Sully was coaching just in terms of clearly there was a scouting report. Clearly they, they knew what each, they had a role for each guy on their own team. You know, ET was, was, was just as important as Dallas, Florida, Dallas, Sully. All those guys combined were working really hard to win this thing. Um, so I do think that coaching um, – is, is just as important as playing, just like it is in college basketball, just like it is in NBA. Yeah, 
Yeah, I totally agree. It's a, it's a really fascinating dynamic because the guys, as you have seen, are so good at this level now. You know, I've always got a rule of thumb that I never really knew before TBT, but my rule of thumb is like, if you've been playing professionally for three years after school, you are a really, really good player. You know, like they, at that point, overseas teams have cut bait with you. If you can't get it done, they're going to, they're going to let you go. And you can't really survive on reputation alone uh, three years out of school. And, um, you know, these guys are all so good and they're so adaptable and they've played in so many different systems that now it seems like um, the coaching element really is the, the differentiator between the teams that are really doing well and the teams that are kind of getting bounced in the first round. So I guess it's important that we, you know, we talked about Corona time. What's the state of TBT right now in, in the world we're living in? You know, we're um, – obviously, you know, living under the same circumstances as everybody else. I think the realities of, you know, where the event are, um, are as affected by coronavirus as everybody else. So there's a million different scenarios. I, I've been telling um, everyone that's asked is that, you know, everything is on the table right now, you know, from um, potentially reducing the field to reducing the prize to um, playing in a single location to doing this under quarantine. We have a specific plan we feel really good about it. You know, we're working with um, epidemiologists from Johns Hopkins to ensure the safety, not only of um, the players and uh, coaches, but also ourselves. You know, we're going to have to comply with the same regulations and rules as everybody else is. So what we're trying to do is just um, take it as, as cautiously as we can. Um, the thing that we have, I think, to our advantage is that it's a short event. You know, this whole event could be played if you had to, you could play it in 14 days. And so if you're, if you're a short event, you're the ask that you're making of the players is a lot different than it would be if you're trying to complete a three month season. I think number one, now, number two, the guys that compete in TBT are great guys. And it's really funny to say that because of course they would be great guys. Right. But the, um, the difference between a lot of the guys that have competed in TBT and do compete in TBT and some of the other professional athletes out in the world is that these guys have really struggled to, to craft a career. Um, over the years, you know, there's nothing that's going to humble you more or make you appreciate uh, playing in front of a worldwide audience in ESPN than a 10 hour bus ride uh, through Lithuania trying to get from point A to point B. And so the guys are really willing to do a lot of different stuff. And I think that that's going to really work to our advantage this summer. You know, we've got a really good plan. I'm really confident that we're going to be playing basketball this summer and that it's going to be the most competitive place anywhere ever. You're going to love it. Love to hear that. So one of the biggest things that I've been missing, and I know Joey the same, and maybe yourself too, since this whole quarantine started, is the lack of ability to wager on <laughs> sporting events. You know, yeah. the Korean baseball games and yep. four of them are starting to happen. But I'm kind of curious what your guys' plans are to incorporate gambling in terms of maybe getting in a sports book or – or yeah. DraftKings, just kind of anything you guys have planned with that. Yeah, we've done, um, we've done a variety of, of stuff over the years. We've done a lot of outreach. One of my roles within TBT is general counsel. And so as a part of that, I've kind of done as much as I'm personally going to do with respect to reaching out to casinos and things like that and the gaming commissions. I do think that um, this year, you know, certainly if we're like the only thing that's out there, you're going to see lines at the books uh, on every single game. There have been lines on quite a few TBT games in the past, and usually what it depends upon is the information available to the books themselves. So you could have gone, for example, to Vegas last summer and placed bets on the entire uh, quarterfinals through the championship game. Uh, select other games were available as well. Um, so from that perspective, you know, a strict uh, you know, legal gambling on sports perspective, that, that has happened for several years. The, um, the thing that we've always tried to do is build up the bracket element of this event. You know, we do a bracket contest and have done one in the past. I hope we're going to be able to do that again this year, um, sponsorship permitting. But I think that it lends itself naturally to, um, you know, the, the, the sort of same type of pool activity that you would have for March Madness. So I'm hoping that there are all these pools out there that we just don't even know about that are going on and hopefully there are. But yeah, I agree. I think actually, to be honest with you, and it's a conversation we've had a lot, is that there's so many more opportunities for in-game gambling with TBT than there would be almost in any other scenario. Absolutely. Can you imagine like total points scored in the um, Elam ending? I, uh, who, uh, a prop bet on who's going who's gonna to hit the Elam ending winner. Um, you know, like that stuff alone I think is fascinating. Um, the over-unders are totally different because of the Elam ending, so you never really know, you know wh what's really going to happen. 
um, it just is a lot of fun to think about. So I'm, I'm all in favor of that. I hope the more that that happens, the more popular the event becomes. So you mentioned the Elon ending before we really dive into that, staying on the gambling. How does that work? How does you know, <laughs> factor into the actual, like, if you're just taking the game straight up, does the Elon ending have any impact on a TBT game betting straight up? Um, I, I mean, I think so. It depends on when you, if you place the wager ahead of the game or not. You know, I mean, I do think that we have very, very close games. We don't have a ton of blowouts um, because it's a short game. It's, it's, if you would play it out, if, like if the Elam ending were exactly at four minutes of game time, it's a 36-minute game. So whenever you have a more compressed um, game time, you're going to have fewer possessions. Fewer possessions leads to more variability, but it also leads to um, a, a, a shorter gap between the winning team and the losing team, so to speak. So your spread, bet, your spread bets are going to be closer. Um, over-unders, I think, are going to be honestly like on par with college basketball because even though the game is shorter, the guys are more skilled. And so as a result, you know, you're not going to have um, very low-scoring games uh, by and large. Um, defense is what wins in TBT. It wins everywhere. And so you know, teams that are more defensively inclined are going to do better, but they also get out of the break a lot more too. So it just is an interesting – um, dynamic. I, I don't have a betting strategy, if that's what you're asking. Um, having never bet on TBT myself, I, I can't say one way or the other how it works. Well, it's clear that you have two gambling consultants should you ever need them <laughs> for the TBT moving forward, especially because you got to imagine if the NBA is talking about playing in Vegas, I mean, like, I'm, su I'm sure that would just take it to a whole nother level, but that's another oh, story yeah. for, for another day. Um, but we do want to dive into the Elam ending. There are two incredible traditions that TBT has basically started. And it's the, the sticker on the bracket, and it's the Elam ending. We want to get to the Elam ending quickly, though. Let's talk about how the sticker idea kind of came to be. Because I got to do it once in the NCAA tournament, and it was the yeah. coolest part of winning. 100, that, the, we, didn't go, we didn't go as crazy. We didn't go crazy until we did that. So yeah. you give us a brief – you know, story about how that started? Yeah. So before we launched, you know, um, and even after, you know, we were still developing ideas about what could we do to differentiate TBT visually? What would it look like? What was our color scheme going to be? I mean, really fun types of things to think about. And um, I think it was John that came up with this idea that they were going to have a sticker. It's essentially a tag. We call it a bracket tag. And so, you know, what we have is a giant bracket that we put up in every arena that we play in. And it's modeled after the bracket from uh, the Karate Kid. If you've ever seen the original Karate Kid, the All Valley bracket is a black uh, background and it's got yellow and gold um, on it in a very distinctive color. And as Daniel LaRusso advances down the bracket in the Karate Kid, they're moving his name, you know? And so that's kind of what we wanted to do. But we thought it would be better rather than have one of us move the name down the bracket if the team itself were to move the, move the thing down. And so it's really evolved since 2014 in the first year into this incredible celebration now. And when you, were, when you watch this, it's, you know, you still might be six wins away or, you know, five wins away from winning the whole thing, but the guys are so excited about it. And now it's become this great thing in sports. The NCAA has adopted it. Um, I'm an LSU football fan, so I, no offense guys, but um, Joe Burrow. I was watching, um, I was watching <laughs> Joe Burrow this year, like move the bracket down the, down the line as they won in the playoffs. And like, that's an incredible development uh, and, and, you know, something that we sort of instituted in sports that um, everybody seems to be doing now. And it's really, really exciting to see that happen. I love it every time I see it, no matter the context. It's the most underrated thing in sports right now. We, yeah. I, everyone, especially with the TBT, everyone talks to the Elam ending. The, the bracket doesn't get enough love. It just doesn't get enough yeah. love. But yeah, I agree. We, but we do, the people want to hear about the Elam ending, of course. Yeah. The, 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 M, the NBA had the best all-star game ever because the Elam ending. Yeah. So yeah. let's hear the origin story of that. Um, the, the short story is that Nick Elam is a literal genius. He's a member of Mensa. And he emailed us blindly at info at the tournament .com with an idea of how he could fix the problem of deliberate fouling at the end of a game. So he differentiates a deliberate foul from an intentional foul just in the sense that a deliberate foul is one that you commit in order to stop the clock because you're running out of time at the end of a game. He was, um, this was his um, hobby, basically. You know, he watched thousands and thousands of games in the NCAA um, as well as in the NBA, and he cataloged all of them. He had some amazing statistics that I'm going to botch, I'm sure, but it's like 97% of the time the following has no impact whatsoever and doesn't change the result of the game. 
So he came up with this idea of basically turning the clock off um, at a certain point in the fourth quarter, establishing a target store, score based upon the team that was in the lead, and then playing to that score. There's no overtime. There's nothing. And so he sent us this email. Um, you know, we read it. John did a really deep dive on it. We started talking about it. It's like, man, this is a really good idea. Like, why would we not do this? And the, the short answer is the first year that we did it, um, we did it in a play-in event that we were doing that year called the Jamboree. And we, we did the Jamboree to give teams an opportunity to play, but we really wanted to see what it would look like in the course of a real game. And it was apparent the first time we saw this being played, the energy level in the gym just went through the roof. The defensive intensity, as heavy as it had been before, was even heavier. You know, everything about the game was better with the Elam ending. And so we watched those first 15 games that first year and then decided that's it. We got we to gotta throw this in because the world needs to see what this thing is. And, you know, we've tweaked it over time. And um, now, you know, as you said, the All-Star game adopted it. It was the best All-Star game ever, I, I think, hands down, certainly that I've ever seen. And I was sitting there in the stadium um, next to John watching this whole thing. And Nick Elam was sitting right next to me because yeah, we he had been invited by the NBA. So we're sitting there talking to Nick. And we, we were saying, oh, don't let this game get within 10 points. If it's 10 points going into the fourth, that's it, you know. And sure enough, it, it got within 10. And then, it, as you saw, it just was like a heavyweight uh, boxing match. They that were taking whole charges. I mean, it's it was unbelievable. Kyle Lowry took two charges. By the way, <laughs> Kyle Lowry showed up to the first ever um, TBT because his guys from uh, Villanova on that same team were playing. The guy's been a huge TBT fan ever since. So, you know, it showed a little bit in that fourth quarter. But it's, 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 an, it. it's just amazing. Like, if you, if you can't get excited watching a game come down to the wire when you know that the next bucket wins, like, you just don't have a pulse. You know, there's just no way to, no way to not get excited about that. So – Without uh, giving too much of your secrets away, and I think the Elam ending is one of the reasons, you know, we've seen leagues like the XFL, AAF kind of come and go. Why do you think TBT has been able to sustain throughout its entire tenure and get bigger and bigger and bigger moving forward? Well, I think a lot of it is, you know, sort of the tenacity that, uh, you know, John has had and our team has had with making the event work. I think that's number one. But the second thing is that, uh, we're not hidebound by any kind of tradition, you know, and frankly, like if we were, we would never do the Elam ending. We would have played it straight the whole time. Um, we never would have done this bracket celebration. We would have tried to maintain a professional demeanor and blah, blah, blah. Like we're just, we're just fans that are trying to put on a fun event. And so when you are um, un, unchained by the, the, the standards of convention, you can be more creative about how you're trying to approach these things. You know, everything that we try to do has been with the underlying premise that we want to make it exciting. We want to make it fun. And I think that's prim primarily what it is. You know, the other thing I'll tell you, and I, I learned this in law school, is that um, there hasn't been a league that has been founded since the AFL. And uh, that goes way back over 50 years now that has ever succeeded because you have legalized monopolies within the sports, uh, professional sports industry. And so what TBT is distinctly not at this stage is a league. You know, we're not a league. We're a separate event. We're on a parallel track to what college basketball is doing, to what the NBA is doing, on the other hand. And, um, you know, we've always tried to be distinctive in that regard, too. I guess, I guess now we got to talk favorites. You know, obviously we are, we are Carmen's crew. That, yeah. That's our team. And we think that, <laughs> that they're going to repeat. Um, so either tell us that's the truth or give us some other teams to look out for. I have no reason to doubt that Carmen's crew is going to repeat. So if you say it, I'll, I'll defer to you on that. I do think there's a lot of talent every year in TBT. Um, you know, I will say this, the team that Carmen's crew beat overseas elite, that was one of the best stories in sports that nobody had ever really heard of. I mean, the guys won, uh, they won 29 straight games in single elimination play, which is just ridiculous to me. Um, overseas elite, if they come back, which I think they're going to, um, they're going to be a tough team to beat. They always are. Carmen's crew is going to be really tough. I love the team um, from uh, West Virginia, the best, best Virginia, the alumni team there. Um, I think that team is going to be really good. Um, there'll be another couple of teams that surprise us. Um, you know, but I think that the, the challenge that a lot of teams are going to have this summer is just can they pull it together? You know, um, guys have been out of basketball now for almost two months. Um, if you're not in shape, it's going to be really hard to pull it together. So some teams that we think might be really, really good may not be good. Um, but it's really going to come down to, as it always is, the team that really wants it the most is probably going to win it. Last year, 
There was no stopping John Diebler uh, with a broken, <laughs> broken finger. <laughs> there was no stopping Aaron Kraft. I mean, he still plays the game the exact same way at 30 as he did at 20. Um, you know, so those guys um, are really in a great position to, I think, do really, really well again this summer too. So a couple of the things that stand out to me with TBT, one of them is – as you said, the fun, cool, kind of quirky stuff that you guys do, like the dunk contest where you put – Oh, yeah, yeah. To try and block the guy. <laughs> the yeah. dunk contest. I mean, I, I love that. I think that's outstanding. But then another thing that I love is, like, how polarizing it is on, on Twitter and social media. Like, we, we interviewed Diebler, and he said, you know, my knee is all good now, and I'm going to be returning to Carmen's crew. And I, we said to him, we were like, yo, do you care if we tweet that? Kind of like as, like, kind of like a joke. Yeah. Like, John <laughs> is making a full recovery and expects to be full go this <laughs> summer for TBT. And he was like, yeah, sure, I don't care. And it got hundreds of likes, hundreds of retweets. You guys picked it up and put it on your social media and everything. And it was like making its way through the Ohio State, you know, beat writers, stories like John Deaver. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this <laughs> This is cool. This has the effect that, you know, to an extent, March Madness does to fans that are paying attention. So I tip my hat that I'm not wearing because I didn't get a championship hat, but I tip my hat to the TBT for getting people interested, even in the off season, because that's the hardest thing to do. And you guys seem like you've mastered doing that. Yeah, well, it, honestly, none of it would work without the guys like John Diebler and Aaron Kraft and, you know, Jared Seliger want to be involved and all the guys that have played in TBT. There's a, I, I always say, like, every year it's great because I, I get to have, like, a thousand new friends, you know, and some guys that you only get to see once a year. And every summer now at this point, you know, sometimes it's like a reunion. You know, I met Justin Burrell from Overseas Elite in 2014 when he was playing with Team Barstool, and he wasn't even a starter for that team. And now, you know, seven years later, um, you know, I consider him to be a good friend and I, I never would have met that guy, uh, but for TBT. So it's fun to renew these, you know, relationships every year. I've gotten to know the guys in Carmen's crew now a couple of, for having, you know, known them now for three years. And it's, um, it just is a lot of fun. You know, it's just a fun event. And for me personally, it's been a dream to, to work on this. Do you remember our first conversation about Carmen's crew, which, which was before Scarlet and Gray? Do you yeah. remember our first conversation about trying to get that team set up we were looking for a guy that was the guy like the guy behind the scenes that knew everybody and that could really try to pull it together right and we reached out to you because we were like no this guy's really popular it seems to have a good handle on on things that are neat and cool and uh so i think we reached out that way right yeah i just remember being in my dorm my freshman year in college and getting proposed the idea to reach out to aaron craft jaron sollinger yeah. John Hebler, the list goes on <laughs> meanwhile i've never met these guys before Oh, no, see, don't tell us that. We didn't know that. A recruiting, <laughs> well, at, the, a recruiting at that job. point, at that point, and I'm sitting there on the phone. I'm like, uh, yeah, let me just, uh, yeah, I'll work on it. I mean, like, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, you know, jeopardize my eligibility in any way. But like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll make it happen. And then fast yeah. forward, you know, finally, I'm done with my eligibility, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, just call me a booster, do whatever you got to do, so that I can can be in the arena and stuff and yeah. they're, they're, yeah. they're the champs. It's just crazy. No, it yeah. was great. It was a great, I mean, that, but that's how these, these stories have really worked is that these, the, all of these teams, like literally every single team in TBT starts with uh, some little spark, you know, some conversation that happens between, um, you know, a guy like you, Joey, that may not have known Aaron Kraft personally, but knew a lot of people within the program and all that stuff. And so every team in TBT starts with that kind of a, a conversation. And so, um, you know, sometimes it's an alumni team. Other times it's, you know, a, a team of what I think are overseas superstars, you know, guys that play in the EuroLeague and make a lot of money playing overseas, like in Team Heinz, example, or, or things like that. But that conversation has to start someplace. And in your case, it started in a dorm room at Ohio State. I, I got to follow up with that by saying that walk-ons play a gigantic part in TBT, don't you? I mean, you yeah. know, obviously I've told Andrew about it. There's like six or seven coaches that were walk-ons for their alumni team. Yeah, yeah, totally. And the, what we have found over the years is that most, most of the time, walk-ons are, typically want to get involved in basketball or have a strong interest in love for the game. They have the right personality. Um, I was a college walk-on athlete myself, and I know that from the position that I was in to now, if I had had an opportunity to do something like TBT when I was 22, 23 years old, I would have jumped all over it. It would have been exactly what I wanted to do. And so that niche, I think, is a really good one. 
Um, the other folks that are really good are like graduate assistants, um, you know, student managers that want to get into coaching and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, like walk-ons have been really, really great for us that uh, Kieran Pillar, who organized the fighting alumni the first year, he was the walk-on. And so at Notre Dame, and it's funny because the walk-ons tend to know everybody, you know, like there's, th when true. you're a walk-on, you have to be friends with everybody because if you're not, the coach is not going to keep you. Like you can, there's such <laughs> thing as a dickhead walk-on. You know what I mean? Because the coach is not like, why am I going to waste my time with Joey Lane? This guy's getting in fights <laughs> with everybody. You're like, that's not going to happen. You know, like you've got to be a competitor, but you have to be a friend to everybody. And so walk-ons in that regard are, are perfect for what we're trying to do. I just, I just think it's funny because obviously me, I'm involved, but not nearly as involved as, as some other guys, but you can go down the list and just name a handful of guys. And they're a part of some of the, the teams that are getting the most votes and advancing the furthest, yeah. whether it's Wichita State and their right. two walk-ons are their coaches, Dayton, who's going to be one of the teams to look out for this year. I mean, it's just it's just very funny how walk-ons always find their way into every situation ever. They always do. They always do. There's, a, there's, a, there's an actual fraternity when it goes on with uh, walk-ons. We, we, the walk-on fraternity that, that is a group of friends that, that are my friends, we joke every year about starting a TBT team. And then we, it, when it comes down to it, we're like, do we really want to just play one game against Pope? <laughs> Probably not. So let's just not do it. You got that enough through the four years of college, most likely. Exactly. And yeah. then when people are people tweet out when when Carmen's crew will tweet like we got an, a a new guy joining the team and everyone even Zoldan Andrew is texting me. Is it you? Like, are you the next guy? I'm like, hell no, they don't want me. What is like? Come on, there's that's really not funny. wasting a roster spot. Come on. I told Joey. I said. If I find out through Twitter and not from you that you're on Carmen's crew, that will be the end of our friendship. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a friendship breaker right there. Yeah. So we love, we love walk-ons, obviously. You know, we had an episode where we just had like 50 walk-ons come on and tell stories. <laughs> but there's no walk-ons without stars. And last year there was a lot of star power. You know, you had Chris Paul pulling up. Boogie Cousins was involved. Are there any guys that, you know, come two weeks before the tournament, you're going to be like, surprise, this guy's involved this year. Anything behind the scenes pre-corona? Because that's obviously yeah. going to have an impact on that. We'll see. I mean, I think that there, every year there are conversations that we have with, um, you know, guys that you would know, you know, NBA stars and former retired players and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of times they are interested in starting a team. Um, you know, I will see. I mean, our, our position has always been to try to maximize the publicity of that kind of thing. So I don't want to reveal anything yet. But I do think Chris Paul uh, probably will be involved again um, in some capacity. I think the challenge that he's going to have is, you know, if we have to play this event, for example, under quarantine, um, I think it's going to be a real challenge for Chris to do that. Um, by the same token, um, you know, he may very well be playing basketball this summer with Oklahoma City if the NBA comes back. So him specifically, we'll have to see. But, you know, we'll see. There's people nibbling around the edges every year. And, um, you know, it's always been fun to see those guys get as excited about TVT as we do. I was fascinated. Like I thought one of the coolest parts for us it was, after the all-star game was listening to all the guys at the press conference, talk about how much they love the Elam ending and how much they watch this in the summer. And I think we had heard a lot of that anecdotally. And sometimes you'll see something on, on, um, you know, social media. Oh, it's like, you know, like LeBron last summer was watching his high school teammates play for mid American unity um, in Columbus. And I thought, Oh man, that's really great. You know, but then he said that in front of a worldwide audience after the all-star game, uh, that he was watching TVT every summer. And I think that stuff is really neat because those guys know basketball and they're not just going to waste their time watching something that they don't get enjoyment out of. And, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's cool. It's cool to see those guys get involved. I think it's very clear that in, I don't know, nine years, there'll be a banana boat team where you got, you got <laughs> Brian, you got Carmelo <laughs> Anthony, you got all, Dwayne Wade, every, maybe they're not playing, maybe they're playing a couple minutes here, a couple minutes there, but they are the sponsor of the banana boat team with the yellow jerseys. I see it now. I'm sure it could you be see great. That would be huge. Maybe it would be their kids in nine years. It would be their kids playing. That's you know? you a never good know. point. They forego their, their college eligibility to play that summer yeah. in TVT. I think yeah. that's the next step. So That'd kind awesome. of – Kind of my last question. Um, are we going to get a last dance TBT team this summer filled with former Bulls players from those championship teams? Oh, that's a great idea. I never even thought about that. That's a great idea. Maybe. I mean, I think they would. I think, <laughs> honestly, Jordan probably would not score more than 20 a game right now if he was playing at age 57, right? Or 60. How old is he right now? 60? He's 50 something. 
Yeah. Hey, he's scoring all the Elam ending points. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Once the Elam ending he might score it. He would be. Do you think he, we, this is a debate we have all the time is like, who would be the greatest Elam ending closer of all time? You know, like if you were to just trust somebody that they were going to score the winning basket, um, who would you take? I mean, I think I'm taking three guys that come to mind for me. I think who? if you say yours, Joey, I think Michael Jordan, I mean, the dude, that's the easy answer. But, and Kobe, another easy answer. But then what about Robert Ory? Give it to, give it, if you need three points, shot, Rob. Yeah. give it to him on the wing. He's knocking it down. That, those, yeah. are, those are guys that I'm thinking of. If I'm, going, if I'm going current era, I'm taking, well, you got to say, I'm taking LeBron to make the right basketball play. <laughs> taking, I'm taking Kyrie, Durant, and Steph to hit those six or eight points. In no, the Kawhi. Era. I'm Kawhi if we're talking current. Kawhi's probably my number one current guy. Kawhi might make that last shot, but I, I think Steph and KD are, and Kyrie are the best. We'll go score all the hey, Elam ending points. All things considered, and I know that we're – Dan, this is your interview, but we're, we're hijacking it. We're hijacking it. Go ahead. All things considered, Kawhi is the best defender, right? And you got to stop the team. You can't just, you can't just score the points. you got to stop the other team. And he's clutch. Hey, just – that's all. That's all I'm saying. And, Dan, you have the final say. Tell us who's correct. I mean – Oh, you guys are all right. I mean, I'm, I probably would go with Will Chamberlain, to be honest with you. Like, it's kind of hard to recognize how physically dominant that guy was because he was so much bigger than everybody else in that era. But even today, he would still be the biggest and fastest guy on the court. And, um, you know, just a ridiculous score. Couldn't shoot free throws, though. So maybe, maybe that's a bad choice. Mm-hmm. I mean, I grew up as a Larry Bird fan. And so for me, I, my instinct is to save Larry and just let, I, it, let it I end. think Larry Bird's a great call also. Shaq was yeah. one guy that came to mind too just because pure dominance. But at the same time, like the only way to stop the Elam ending is if guys are missing free throws. Yeah. You know? it's like the, yeah. That's like the weird loophole, you know? Yeah. There's and, so much pressure. Like you have yeah, to have exactly. somebody that has some cojones, you know, because if you don't, you're in trouble. Like, I, I think it was Aaron, was it Aaron, Aaron Craft or John Deeble were saying last summer about how they got into Elam many times. Like, everybody kind of clenched up, and that last basket became the hardest basket they've ever had to shoot. Oh, it turns into a literal – I mean, you know, it turns into a pickup game where you're playing to 21, and guys are – everyone everyone wants to shoot the last shot, and no one wants to shoot the last shot because yeah. they're excited yeah. and nervous, and that's what creates such an unbelievable dynamic. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Dan, I think that's kind of uh, all the questions we have. You got any questions for us? We like to usually wrap up, wrap up our interviews by letting our interviewees ask us some questions. When, when do you guys think – like, when do you guys think you would be comfortable as sports fans um, going back into an arena? Tomorrow. To watch a big game? I, I would go personally tomorrow. <laughs> you would? Would you, wear, would you wear a mask if you went? I would personally go – feel comfortable going tomorrow if there was some sort of social distancing between the seats yeah. full packed arena hundred percent capacity i'm probably going when there's a vaccine what about you joey i i think i'm a little i'm a, on a different level than, than andrew i would what makes me nervous is not the fact that sitting watching the game six feet apart that they got under control but how would you go about the concessions and yeah. the bathroom? I would be way more nervous to go to the bathroom than I would be to sit in my seat and watch the game. That's yeah. where I'm, that's where my reservations come. I think I would be comfortable though. Like where, especially like, if I was going to a baseball game and being outside, I, I would have no, I would have no problem, but I'm just, my psyche can't wrap my head around it right now. And if, if the world opened up a little bit, and we were going to restaurants and taking the necessary precautions and all that stuff in a week, two weeks. I could see myself a month from now rationalizing the idea of going to a game. Would I be super excited? I'm, that's not who I am just in general. I'm a little bit of a baby in terms of that stuff, you know? So, so <laughs> yeah. I'm not entirely sure. I will say, though, the Thursday that the world, the sports world shut down, I think it was a Thursday, maybe it was a, I think it was yeah, Thursday, Thursday, March 12th. Tournament. Yeah, so when it shut down, we were on our way to the Big Ten tournament, my family. So the fact that we, and, and we stopped ourselves and we, we were on the, the list of the friends and family that were allowed to attend. Um, you know, we weren't, we, we were, we were, you know, the friends and family of the, you know, the 27 allotments, ticket allotments that they had. And we still were like, and this was before we knew what was going on. We still were like, we probably shouldn't go. 
that's kind of where I stand in terms of you shouldn't, you probably shouldn't go, but would I go? Probably would. Yeah. Well, I think also, you know, there's a lot of people who are living with their parents right now, like Joey and I, and potentially seeing their grandparents. So I think I'd have no problem going to a game if I was going home to my apartment by myself at night. Right. Considering that we live with our parents, see our grandparents, siblings, stuff like that, I would probably stray away from going to games until I could kind of quarantine at home by myself after. Thanks yeah. for the shout out that we're living with our parents still, Andrew, though. <laughs> a lot of people are living with their parents. I wouldn't be surprised if Dan went home for the quarantine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But, but yeah, I hope, hope that I'm like the I'm like in the opposite end of that bracket. I've got four kids running around my house distracting yeah. me all day because school's been canceled forever, and it's probably never going back. And so, uh, yeah, that's an interesting perspective because I think I think you guys are pretty representative of most you know sports fans when it comes to that perspective. You know, you've got about half of the people that say I'd go back right now and not worry about it. But I do think we're going to have to adjust as fans what our expectations are. You know, going forward, at least for some period of time. And then um, yeah. everything should be hopefully back to normal. I think the cool thing, though, is if you say no fans, you know, because for whatever reasons, the, the government doesn't let you, um, your, your self-conscious doesn't let you, whatever it is, it would make it that much cooler of an event, you know, because it's a one-of-a-kind. It, it goes from already a one-of-a-kind event to an even, yeah. an even more of a one-of-a-kind event that yeah. is must-see television because you're never ever going to see on TV a basketball game with no fans. You're never. Well, I see. always laugh because in our first couple of years, we basically played in front of no fans anyway. So <laughs> it really, really wasn't for us. It's not that big of an adjustment, you know. Like we've yeah, been there before, and uh, you know we can kind of figure out how to do it. But I do think there's there's certainly like game presentation stuff you can do that's almost better because you don't have to worry about um, you know f- getting crowd shots and all that kind of stuff. You can really capture a lot of audio that you wouldn't get otherwise. So yeah, I think it's going to be fun. This is just you know. The way I kind of see this as a world is that it just is one more challenge that we have to overcome, and it's certainly one that we're going to. And, you know, if, it, um, if everything went smooth all the time, you wouldn't have any appreciation for anything. That's all I know. 100%. All right, Dan, well, thank you. This was an awesome, awesome interview. We appreciate you coming on. We hope to have you on again soon, hopefully discussing what's going on with the TBT this summer. Thanks, we guys. We've been running. A lot of fun. Thank you. All right. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Drive the Lane. Uh, The day after, you probably enjoyed the last two episodes of The Last Dance, which we, of course, think was absolutely incredible. We'd love to hear on Twitter your guys' opinion. I have a quick Tony Kukoc story, which I think everyone will think is funny. This is the first time Joey's hearing it, too. So I was good friends with his daughter growing up, and I went to his house for some, like, seventh grade party get together might have been a halloween party or something he opens the door in his boxers all right and his and his boxers are like like khakis to me and you like sweatpants for me and you that's how long his legs are so whatever i go in his house i'm downstairs i think i came up a little later and i was talking to him because for us when you're in seventh grade it's like okay this guy used to play on the bulls that's not as cool as someone who's on the team right now even though he was way now it's now it's just insanity. Right. Continue. Sorry. So I'm talking to him, and he looks at me, and he goes, you want to see my rings? And I go, yeah, I want to see your rings. And he pulled out, like, a little box, and he opened it up, and, and his championship rings were in there. That is amazing. I have a Greg Oden story like that that's so inappropriate that I can't share. <laughs> but, I'll sh- but I think I've shared it with you before. Just – all just an all-time geo story but anyway the last dance that's on drive that's that'll be on drive the lane gold (laughs) (laughs) you drive the lane platinum because i really can't yeah but um no i think the last dance was so cool i've talked about it before it's a little confusing like that's just the only frustrating thing with me is if i wasn't a huge bulls fan i would not get it wait hold on before you finish that sentence let's go talk about something that happened in 2004 (laughs) <laughs> seriously did you know the detroit pistons actually ended up winning another championship let's fast forward to rip hamilton and have an interview with him like no that has nothing to do with what's going on but he was a bull no shut up yeah. oh, my god oh man no i have a few things written down though about it that i want to share um um number one is that michael jordan is the best player of all time um <laughs> number two 
Number two is that um, we tried really, really hard to get Michael Jordan on for drive the lane, and, and it just – we couldn't find a good time to have him. And um, number three is Steve Kerr is the most unappreciated guy ever. That dude is – goes Ooh. everywhere and wins. No I got a I gotta reverse take for that. Okay. I think if Steve Kerr was not the Warriors coach, he would not be as used in this documentary. He's more famous than he was because of what's happened in the last seven years. I think there would be other players that would, that would have a bigger role. I think you're right about that, but I also think that because he got punched in the face, he was going to be in it regardless. <laughs> I wish they had footage of that. I mean, they probably do. Yeah. Well, Wennington um, – apparently Bill Wennington, like, recorded everything but will not release it, refuses to release it. I love – he – so his son coaches at Lake Forest College, so we, he would always be sitting behind us, like, at these games, but we never said anything to him. But it's just, like, full circle. Now he's at Lake Forest College games. Mm-hmm. But I think before we end it, we should probably talk a little bit more about our guests. Obviously, Dockage is always fun to have on. But big thanks to Dan Friel. That was really the mo- one of the most fun interviews we've had just because – we haven't, t- we haven't talked to someone like him before. And just to get the perspective of starting TBT and what it stands for and all the cool traditions they've started, it's just been a, it was just an awesome interview. We can't thank him enough for coming on. Hopefully we'll be involved with them moving forward in some capacity. I think we will, whether they like it or not, just because of our ties to all the different people um, on different teams and stuff. But um, I want to further um, my – I want to double down on my statement that I will – I am slowly all the way for Big X in terms of who wow. I would want. It's just wow. – I'm, I'm thinking of it, number one, those are the guys I played with, so that matters. But number two, I want, who would I want to win the championship? I want Big X because they haven't won it before. Carmen Screw already has you – know, that whole deal. So that's where I stand on that. You, I you, think, first off, follow uh, Dan on Twitter at TBT Friel. Follow the tournament at the tournament. Um, but they have enough followers. But still follow him at the tournament. I would be happy if any team with Ohio State alumni won. And there's also a bunch of teams that I'm really excited to watch. This is the most excited I've ever been. And because Carmen's crew won last year, it makes me more excited because it's like less pressure for them to win because they've done it. Exactly. So if they don't win it, obviously it's easy for us to say this, if they don't win it because we're not the ones not getting money. But if they don't win it, it's okay. They've won it. Right. It's just gravy at this point. Right. But at the same time, thinking about like Chiefs fans, Chiefs are going to Chiefs fans are going to want to win the Super Bowl next year and the year after that and the year after that and the year after that. Well, I think you know, that's it's that's a little different because that's a orga- professional right. sports organization, you know, not right. like a but anyway, I I'm so excited for TBT because this episode just in general, like kind of how we talked about at the beginning of the show, the TBT kind of kicked off drive the lane. Like it in no I mean, we were going to kick off regardless, but because of the championship and Carmen's crew winning, like it just made it all come together perfectly. Yep. Now it seems like TBT is going to kick off the sports like world and like be, maybe be the blueprint up for the rest of 2020, how to, you know, run a, mm-hmm. a league or a event or a tournament or whatever. So I, I, I TBT is awesome. They're just the yeah. new school way to do things in the cool way, whether it's the Elam ending or the, or the tournament bracket stickers or, you know, just the idea of interacting so much with their fan base. I just think that they are just – they're head and shoulders just on a different level than other things. You know, like – AAF, XFL, other sports leagues, pay attention to what the TBT is doing because they're doing it right. And you – maybe the, we don't need more football leagues. Maybe we need a football tournament. How cool would that be? How cool would it be if there was a flag football tournament? That would be really cool. Some sort like – where, like, yeah. guys aren't going to get hurt type of deal. Or a dodgeball tournament. That would be really cool. Sure. Think about that. Like, yeah. the movie dodgeball, but with people we know. Yeah. Dockets would have a team in that for sure. Well, yeah. And I, I would make the cut for that team, but I would, yeah. I'm not going to make the cut for the other team. But um, I guess we, if you're still listening, it's a good point in time to, to let you guys know that me and Andrew know things that you guys don't know, so stay tuned to, to Drive the Lane for us to break that stuff, whether on Twitter or um, on this show. So, so yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the last thing I want. That's the it. That's the it. I mean, that's the end. That's, why, up. that's why you listen. Buckle up. Drive the Lane. What's up, Josh Schaffner? 
and we'll see you guys soon. You know, we're not doing it every week, but we will see you guys soon. Buckle up, drive the lane. <laughs> Go Buckeyes, baby. Go Carmen's crew and Big X and overseas – or not overseas. In no, not league. overseas. Elite. Great Lakes Great Elite. Lakes. Yeah. Shout out Jake Lorba. All right. Peace. Thanks for watching. Subscribe below to get the latest videos from Letterman Row. We've got Letterman Live. We've got the practice report. we got rapid reaction. Hey, and you know we got Buck IQ with Zach Bourne. For sure. we got recruiting breakdowns with Berm. we got whatever you need. Ohio State football and Ohio State athletics, we've got you covered here at Letterman Row.